Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Flint. I'm the director of the Center for Philosophy of Religion. And on behalf of the center, I'd like to welcome all of you to the sixth annual Planting a Fellow Lecture. Our speaker today is the current Planting a Fellow in the center, Rene van Woudenberg, who's a professor in the Department of Philosophy at the Free University in Amsterdam. Rene received his PhD from the Free University in 1991 with uh, Nick Wolterstorff as his director. And then after a year as a postdoc um, at the Catholic University of Utrecht, he spent the 1992 to 93 year here at Notre Dame as a postdoctoral fellow with the center. He's taught at the Free University for well over a decade. And upon his return to Holland this fall, he will become chair of the department there. So naturally, if you want to, you can extend condolences to him during the reception. Rene writes on a wide range of topics, principally in epistemology, metaphysics, and philosophy of religion. He's written, edited, or co-edited over a dozen books, one of them being the Cambridge Companion to Thomas Reed. Uh, he's written dozens of articles covering both contemporary controversies and famous names from the past, Thomas Reed, Immanuel Kant, John Locke, and others. He's also organized many epistemology conferences in Amsterdam. And for the last seven years, he served as the co-director of the Center for Epistemology and Ontology there. We'll follow our normal procedure for the Friday Colloquium. That is, we'll have Renee's talk, followed by a two to three minute break, which will last about five minutes, probably. Then we'll have questions and then a reception out in the Great Hall. I'm sure all of the fellows at the center this year would agree with me that Renee's been a, a most congenial and valuable colleague. And I'm delighted to present him to you today. He's speaking on the topic Religious Belief and the Limits of Science. René van Woudenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, when Tom Flint invited me to deliver the Planninga Fellow Lecture, he made it clear that it should be geared to an audience somewhat wider than an audience of professional philosophers. And so it shall be. I will abstain from uh, technicalities and move about on a rather general level. My doctor Vater, as we say in non-standard Dutch, but in good German, and dear friend Nicholas Wolterstorff, once remarked that a philosopher should be able to do at least two things, though not necessarily at the same time. A philosopher should be able to work with care and craftsmanship on uh, concepts on arguments, very specific kind of work, at the same time or at other times actually, the philosopher should also be able to uh, paint a bigger picture that somehow make intelligible why this nitty gritty work is being done. And now my, my lecture will obviously be of the second type, of the bigger picture type, and accordingly it will be uh, somewhat sketchy and programmatic. It indicates a certain broad direction that I think it is fruitful and important to explore in philosophy or as a philosopher in much greater detail, but not uh, on this occasion, but at a later time. I have chosen a topic uh, on which the name giver of this lecture, L. Planninga, has pronounced on many occasions with a rigor, subtlety, depth, grace, and humor that so many of us so rightly admire namely the relationship between Christian belief and science. Before I start out, however, I want to acknowledge that in the US, but also in Europe, the Center for Philosophy of Religion is looked upon as an institution than which no greater one in its sort exists. <laughs> what is written by the Notre Dame philosophers of religion, be it El Planninga or Peter van Inhagen or Tom Flint, or Mike Ray, or Robert Audi, or others, is without exception rigorous, vigorous, clever, and relevant. I myself am a happy and fortunate beneficiary of their work. 
and I, I hope I'll continue to be that. And the same holds for many of my colleagues in the department. There can be no doubt about the fact that ever since the rise of modern science, very many people have claimed that given the findings of modern science, the rational stance to take towards traditional Christian faith is to either abandon or drastically reform it. This claim, which I call the central claim, and it's the first sentence on your handout, um, has been supported by considerations having to do with such topics as chance, evolution, chaos, and the laws of nature. I'm not going to deal now with any of these more specific considerations in any detail as I have done on other occasions, but will instead something, say something far more general about science. What I'm going to propose this afternoon is that the claim that I've just mentioned, this central claim, can only be appealing when one neglects or somehow plays down the importance of certain limits that are indigenous to science. Accordingly, I'll spend quite some time arguing that science as we currently know it has its limitations. Now, saying that science is limited is, of course, very different from saying, from, from criticizing science. I take science with utter seriousness. I take my guitar with real seriousness as well. But I must say the instrument has its limits. I can't produce on it, for instance, that golden sound of a horn on it. Nor can I drive to Chicago in it. <laughs> My lecture is organized as follows. First, I'll make some very general comments uh, about uh, the crucial notions, science, and I'll make a very general comment about Christian faith for the, re the religious beliefs that my title refers to are the religious beliefs indigenous in Christianity. Next, I shall argue for various limits of science. Actually, I, have to, I had to cut out uh, a whole uh, a lot of the material there, but still there is a lot left. And finally, I shall indicate exactly how these limits that I'm pointing to, how they relate, how they are relevant for the claim, the central claim that, that I've mentioned, so the claim that given modern science, the, the proper stance toward traditional Christianity is to either abandon or drastically reform it. On the notions science and Christian faith, the first section. The word science doesn't denote one very specific thing or one specific kind of thing. Not a thing with characteristic and definite features. For starters, science can be used to denote an activity, the activity of doing science. But it can also be used to denote the results of that activity, the so-called findings of science. But those results come in a rather startling variety. They may take the form of an ordered description of phenomena, but they may also take the form of an explanation of those phenomena or the form of predictions of phenomena. But not all science displays all of these features. Carl Linnaeus, for instance, founded modern taxonomy, but he didn't explain or aim to explain the origin and nature of the living organisms that he ordered. And some, scientific, and some scientific theories, for instance, those about the extinction of dinosaurs, they do not predict new results. Furthermore, in some sciences, certain theories play a crucial role. For instance, in evolutionary psychology, the theory of kin altruism plays a central role. But there are um, genuine branches of scientific activity where no such kind of theory uh, plays uh, any role like that at all, in history, for example. It is therefore, or it may therefore be impossible to say exactly what kind of thing science is, for science isn't something exactly. Science to use an oft-used uh, locution from Wittgenstein, is a family resemblance concept. Some things called science share, share some of their features with some, but not, other, but not all of the other things called science. And this means that science has vague boundaries. 
And this is reflected by the fact that there have always been discussions about the demarcation of science, discussions about whether or not a particular way of thinking or a particular body of propositions or a particular way of dealing with phenomena really is science. At one time, for instance, social Darwinism was considered a science, whereas nowadays it will generally be denied that status. Obviously, what I've been saying so far about science potentially debilitates discussions about the limits of science. For if science is not a well-defined thing, if it's a vague concept, it will be very risky to say something definite about the limits of science. Well, in order to reduce the risk, I shall therefore be concentrating on, on the broadly natural sciences, unless indicated otherwise. I'll make some uh, exceptions. And for the rest, I shall have to rely on our genuine ability to cope with vague notions. As to Christian faith, the following has to suffice. As I will be thinking of it, someone has Christian faith if she or he affirms the ecumenical creeds in a way that involves believing that what its articles state, for example, that the heavens and the earth were created by God, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who was raised from the dead, etc., that it's true. But having Christian faith involves more than believing these things to be true. It also involves trusting God, praising and thanking God, standing to God in a special relationship, experiencing his loving care. It involves, in one word taken from one of the Psalms, friendship with God. Two, limits of science. Before I lay out my reasons for thinking that science is limited in various respects, it bears noting that limits of science can either be of a practical or of a theoretical kind. They can be of a practical kind insofar as they have to do with limits on financial and technological resources, but they can also be of a practical kind having to do with moral scruples. So certain things shouldn't be um, objects of scientific investigations, uh, I think, and many of us think. 